live from Orlando, Florida, it's theCUBE. Covering ServiceNow, Knowledge17. Brought to you by ServiceNow. Welcome back, this is day three of ServiceNow Knowledge 17, and this is theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage, where we go out to the events and we extract the signal from the noise. My name is Dave Vellante, and my co-host this week has been Jeff Frick. Not only this week, Jeff, but for the last five years, we've been doing ServiceNow Knowledge, uh, knowledge events, really getting a sense as to what this company is all about, the evolution of the company, the transformation from really early days of sort of IT, help desk, service management, to now just permeating throughout the enterprise. One of the key things, Jeff, that is you know, notable and that we saw a couple years ago, I think it was three years ago when they had the first CreatorCon. Uh, in fact, actually in 2013, I think you did a little sidebar. You went out. It was a hackathon. Did, it was a hackathon. We were with hackathon Alan yeah. uh, Lewand and, and checked in on the and, hackathon. And the point I want to make is that that we work with you know, these, these events, we come to these events, we see a lot of large company events, and whether it's Oracle or IBM or you know, HPE even in the past, even EMC with its code initiative, they are drooling over developers. Right, right. They can't get enough developer action. And it's like ServiceNow builds this platform, they, they create, they open it up with this low code you know, development kit essentially, throw their glove on the field, and everybody comes to the game. Right, right. It's just amazing. And so today, day three is about CreatorCon, and it was hosted by Pat Casey, who's the Senior Vice President of DevOps. Um, really the, the sort of closest, I think, uh, to, the, to the Fred Luddy DNA, right? I mean, that's really Pat. You know, Fred Luddy's the founder of the company and sort of the icon of ServiceNow, not here. Right, right. You know, we're entering a new, new era, and it's really underscored culturally by CreatorCon and, and Pat Casey. You were in there today, what'd you think? What, was it Fred that turned the citizen developer? I can't remember, I'll have to go back and check the tape, because he talked, definitely talked about low code, and I think he may have been the one that said citizen developer, and it's funny, even with CJ Desai, right, when he was thinking about coming over, what is the first thing he did? He downloaded the app and wanted to create a little app, so everybody here is a developer. And I think, you know, just looking back at some of the, the interviews yesterday, you know, Donna from Cox Automotive, she built a prototype app. It was her one business analyst and an intern to start a whole new perspective. So I think you know, they're really trying to make everybody a developer. It's a different way to think and not just a business analyst and you have to pass it off to development, but using, again, a simple workflow tool. It's still a workflow tool to let everybody automate processes. And we were just in the CreatorCon. The other piece that really strikes me, and it strikes me every time I look at my phone now, you know, my phone knows I follow the Warriors, and so it just automatically gives me an update. So it's kind of this soft, it's kind of this soft um, a push of AI and machine learning into your day-to-day -day activity without kind of this like heavy overlay. And that's really what, how they do it effectively, and then that's kind of the basis of what they're doing here with integrating the machine learning into the applications to collect the data, build the models, try to take some of the mundane, mind-numbing work off of your plate and get people doing into this, you know, real decisions based on the machine giving you better data. It's an incredible dynamic to me, Jeff, because it's not like this company has a blank sheet of paper and says, okay, let's go after developers. They have this impassioned community of people and they just keep rolling out new function and then, of course, ServiceNow has some really killer developers internally and so they make those people available to inspire and, and educate uh, uh, other developers. And so, and it's just, as I say, this, this platform just permeates throughout the organization. I mean, it's really hard to do platforms. Right, you right. know, we've seen it so many times. Uh, you know, companies say, okay, we're developing a platform, and the platform gets a little traction and gets bought out, but you know, this company's service now really has a, a foothold here. So 4,500 people at CreatorCon this year is up from 2,000 last year. So right, another right. example of just super meteoric growth. Um, Pat Casey, I loved, he put up the, you know, he was showed, he showed a mainframe, it actually looked like a Vax to me, but anyway, <laughs> put up a mainframe, and then he showed the sort of, the, the HPUX, what do you call it, HPUX? Yep, yep. And, uh, <clears throat> oh yeah, we thought that was better, and then client server was kind of worked for a while, and then he put up August of 1995, and of course, I was immediately saying Netscape, right? And, right, right. And he, and he showed the Netscape logo, and that really changed the development paradigm. 
just as a way to develop, you know, and I'm sure none of us thought of it. It was just, it was just kind of uh, web bulletin boards with pictures now when you saw Netscape back in the day, but really as an application delivery vehicle when you think of what browsers have become. It's pretty fascinating. I had a, I had a friend who was working on Chrome and they described it as kind of an OS in a browser. And I'm like, we would want an OS in a browser. Well, now we're basically here. It's like the old Sunray machine, right? Anytime you log onto your browser, you're basically into everything in your world, whether it's your phone, tablet, my computer, your desktop computer, it's pretty fascinating. The other thing that, that Pat talked about was, you know, these, these things that we grew up with kind of in our imagination. He talked about flying cars and then he, he adjusted it to, to maybe electronic cars, this, this, this vision. Uh, and now, you know, electronic cars are here and Tesla's the highest selling luxury uh, uh, nameplate out there. But I thought in my old world it was flat TVs. Uh, the Jetsons had flat TVs, and the, the concept of a flat TV was completely bizarre. And I remember seeing the first one uh, in Chicago at the Consumer Electronics Show. It was like nine inches, you had to have secret passage to get back to see it. But now look what happened. I can't help but think of a Mars Law, Dave, and the, he's Gartner's dis trough of disillusionment. I like a Mars Law better, which is we overestimate the impact in the short term, but way underestimate the impact in the long term. Look at flat screens now compared to what didn't even exist now. And that's going to happen in AI, it's going to happen in machine learning, and in a very short period of time, especially with the advances in compute store, networking, cloud, speed of networks, IoT, it's going to be a phenomenal amount of horsepower driving your interaction with all these various and you're objects. Right. I mean, look at even the dot com. You know how uh, overhyped that was, but it really was underhyped. Right, you know, right, right in the long term. <laughs> right, so, uh, the other thing I loved, you know, we've been talking about data for quite some time, and every time we came to a knowledge show, we'd say, is there a big data angle here? And we, yeah, well, kind of. Well, it's really now coming into focus what the machine learning and AI and big data angle is. And Pat threw up a really nice infographic. He went back to 1969. He gave some interesting stats that I wasn't aware of. I knew the 2K, the, the, the moon landing was done on a computer with 2K of memory. <laughs> that I knew. What I did not know is that, that had, it had two programs, one for docking and one for landing, and there wasn't enough memory on the computer to have both programs, so they had to reprogram the computer after the dock. Or after not the even reload, landed. right? They couldn't just put the uh, <laughs> right. USB uh, stick in to right. They had the code, it. which is kind of cool. So that was 2K. He had an intern download the 1982 census, and it was 182 uh, megabytes. And then uh, the Human Genome Project was 53 gigabytes, which he's right, it wouldn't have fit on your previous iPhone, but it will fit on, on this one. Right. And then, I didn't know this stat, uh, the spell checker in all of our, you know, our phones and you know, the, the red lines and so forth, the back end of that that's sitting in the cloud is four terabytes. Right. You know, so you're seeing just these, this explosion of, of data. These are some simple examples. And uh, so this company, is using the, again, it's, it's not just starting from scratch, saying, hey, here's some kind of machine learning tool, apply it. What they're doing is saying, we're going to build this into the platform, take the existing corpus of data that you have. Now, what is that corpus of data? It's a bunch of incidents, it's a bunch of cate categories and people, and it's going to auto-categorize, for example, all these incidents on an existing corpus of data. That's not how most people are using machine learning today. What many people are talking about is a use case of real-time continuous applications and doing machine learning in real time to try to affect an outcome, um, you know, which means try to get you to buy something or try to detect fraud or you know, whatever it is, try to, you know, some healthcare outcome even. Although you, th you think healthcare could be more post-process. But essentially that's what ServiceNow is doing. They're using a post-process methodology on top of this corpus of data to add instant value that lives inside of the platform. It's very compelling, simple, and practical in my view. I, that's the part I love the best, Dave, is simple and practical and delivers immediate results. Alan uh, Leanwine, who we'll have on later, and we've had on a number of times, you know, made a mention that, that the other thing that's very different is now the apps are listening in real time and they're adjusting what they're doing and, and re, uh, re jiggering their algorithm based on stuff that's happening in real time. So it's a different way to think about applications. Um, just, and just a couple of things I wanted to touch on from yesterday with some of the guests we had. Great reason we love the show is the, the, the number of customers we get is so high. And I was just, I was just struck by Donna Woodruff from Cox Automotive, how much she understood innately that it's a platform. Yes, she bought some applications, but she really understood the platform component and was able to drive from it. And the other one I just wanted to touch on was uh, 
Naresh from Vitas Healthcare, and the impact of mobile. Um, also, I could think about when he was talking about his delivery service, right? Like, where's my truck? I, I had a, my fridge fixed the other day. Where's the guy? Is he closed? Call me. And then to apply that to something as powerful um, as, the, as the work that they're doing around hospice and to, and to enable that nurse to get to one more stop per day. Wow, what an impact just by getting on mobile. And, and the funny part he said is some of their older nurses, when they saw the mobile device said, I'm done, I'm not doing it anymore. I'd rather schlep around 25 pages of case information and then go back and forth to the, to the, to the hub, <laughs> you know, in between every stop. So, you know, again, these are, it's this combination of all this power that's coming to bear along the three courses of compute that are now delivering phenomenal transformation to people that are willing to think of things in a slightly different lens. Yeah, when you look at the problems that ServiceNow is so solving, they're in the, they are in the boring but important category, and that's why I think that you know, this company for, for a long time sort of flew under the radar right, right. And, and is still misunderstood. I mean, you know, even CJ, who's now basically in charge of all the products, you know, when he first you know, was, was approached by ServiceNow, he's like, man, I don't really know, and then he dug into it and said, wow. So a lot of people really don't understand it. I talk to a lot of people in the software business, you know, software sales people, that they just don't understand the power of what this company does, and, and I would make a prediction is that, like Salesforce before it, and we've been talking about this for years, how these guys are on a collision course, and they'll say no, 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 but, but very clearly, the power of a platform is, is that Salesforce has, for example, ServiceNow is replicating in some ways much, much different. Right. Uh, because it, uh, Salesforce has a lot of, you know, kind of bolt-ons. Sorry, we, we love it, we use it. But my point is that my prediction is that over time this company is going to become a, 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 a very well-known uh, company because of the impacts that it's having on the business. It's going from boring but important to you know, fundamental transformation of organizations. And like, I tell you, CRM, I even put it up there with ERP. I think that what ServiceNow is doing is as big as the ERP trend, potentially bigger when you put in all the IOT stuff and the machine learning capabilities and, and the like. Um, right. With what is a relatively modern platform? Well, we're, we're in an attention game, right? On the consumer side, it's about attention. The, the, the thing that people have the least amount of anymore is time. So how do you get their attention? Do they spend their time on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, watching TV, looking at YouTube videos? Watch your kids. How do they spend those, those hours of their day? On the work side, what screen are you interacting with in your day? Are you in Salesforce all day? Are you in email all day? Are you in Salesforce all day? Are you in Marketo all day? That's where the competition is going to come. And there's only going to be two or three primary applications in which you engage and get work done. And they've, they're making a hard play to say, we are the application that we want basically in your face that you're using to get stuff done all day long. You know, one of the things too, I wonder, you know, I always wonder, think about blind spots to a company like this. They're on this amazing ascendancy. You know, what could, you know, come in and disrupt ServiceNow. And you think about the millennials, there's no question that ServiceNow is on to the new way to work. I mean, I call it the new way to work. I don't think they use that term. Um, and the millennials are going to come in and they don't want to use email. They're, they're going to be much more open to adopting a, a, a platform. Now, is that platform going to be something like ServiceNow or is it going to be too boring but important? Are they going to do something more like Facebook? Now, my feeling is this is enterprise. And as we talked about yesterday, is it possible that enterprise could actually begin adopting a lot of these consumer-like interfaces and user experiences and leapfrog in some regards because of the use of AI and, 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 and the enterprise nature uh, and the security capabilities that a company like this can bring? I don't know, maybe that's a stretch, but the gap between enterprise and, or consumer and enterprise has to close, it is closing, Right, um, right. And I think it will continue to close. It's, I think it's the automation piece. Do they yeah. automate themselves out of their out of their customer base? I mean, as more and more things are automated, <laughs> there's going to be less and less and less people looking at the screen to do fewer tasks in terms of a, just an, an in. Um, the blind spots always come where you're you know you're not looking, right? That that that's what's going to hit them. But certainly, as more and more of this mundane stuff can be automated, if they can actually execute their vision, so these auto categorization and auto routing and things are getting solved before they get to a customer service agent um, happen, then you know their seat-based licenses 
but that's that's why they're trying to find other places to go, right? Facilities management, HR management, integration on the human connection uh, across multiple applications into even these other systems, like we've heard about um, on on the HR side, et cetera. So, I think that's you know, as as the nature of work changes, what will people be doing with their work? Or are they just going to be getting assigned tasks to go execute that the machines can't do? It's going to be interesting to watch it evolve. Well, and then coming back to sort of our the top of this segment, it's the developers. Then that's really where the innovation occurs. Um, the developer ecosystem here continues to grow. The importance of developers is very well understood. We've seen it with. You know, previously with companies like, like Microsoft, you see all the big enterprise companies trying to appeal to the developer community. Um, certainly Amazon, Google, you know, owning, having great, very strong developer ecosystems, Apple as well, Facebook, and so forth. Enterprise guys continue to, to struggle, frankly, in that regard. I mean, I think IBM's done a good job with Bluemix, and, but it's been a real heavy lift for IBM, HP, I mean, we've talked to you know, from Kadifa to you know all their right, software right. execs, and they just had, you know never were able to figure it out. Oracle kind of lost its developer edge, despite the fact that it owns Java now, uh, and is trying to, trying to get that back. Whereas, as you say, ServiceNow just says, "Hey, let's have a game," they, and they throw their glove in the field, but and also boom, everybody shows up. Think of the focus of a SaaS software company, or even like an Amazon, uh, AWS, right? Everyone here in the company is working on platforms and derivative products from that platform. <coughs> they don't have this hardware group, that hardware group, this software group, that software group. It's a single application uh, at the end of the day. Yeah. Salesforce is a single application at the end of the day. Workday, single application at the end of the day. AWS, infrastructure for, for customers at the end of the day. So I think that gives them a huge advantage in terms of focus, everybody pulling in the same direction. Uh, and ability to execute. Well, everybody talks about platform as a service, and it's really, a lot of people say that's, that whole market's collapsing. It's IaaS plus, think Amazon, and it's, and it's SaaS minus, think Salesforce and, 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 uh, <laughs> and ServiceNow. All right, we got to wrap. Uh, keep Let's it right there, everybody. Up. We'll be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE, we're live, day three from Knowledge17. We'll be right back. <laughs>